you know, like, I mean, you have business experience, you've been out there. Um, there is such a thing as the perception of being busy, and then there's uh, what is it really adds value to business. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's some weeks which are crazy, but the reality is I try to spend my time narrowing really on that thing that will have the biggest multiplier effect for Hello Healthcare. So we're the uh, NBA 403 team. Nice meeting you finally after many digital introductions on Facebook. We're going to start today with just uh, introducing ourselves and then we're going to go around and do a quick icebreaker. And then um, we're going to move into really one of the true things we took away from the case outside of our own individual ideas for Hello Healthcare and what we think could aid to your entrepreneurial vision for the company. And but the first ones we're going to focus on is expansion, which I, we know the business case kind of focused on, on whether or not to expand. And then we're going to move into some other solutions for, your, for the software-based solutions for Hello Healthcare. And then we're going to have a quick break if you need to refill your coffee. And then, um, <laughs> and then when we come back, we have another, a few other really good ideas on some collaborations and partnerships in um, Sub-Saharan Africa that we think are really beneficial to Hello Healthcare's future and new ideas for the company. You acknowledged on Facebook in your in your commentary how difficult it is to be away from the situation, away from the place, and not really familiar with the, the landscape on the ground. But um, from where we sit, these are the issues that we pulled from from your case study. Um, mainly strategic expansion and growth opportunities, the complexity in business to business systems. Anticipating government and regulatory interference, and finally, uh, recruiting values-driven leaders that can help you identify opportunities and build those relationships. Because right now, from what we can see, you're doing a lot of the legwork, which is amazing, but you can't do it all yourself if you want to grow the way that you're hoping to. Um, so we're going to touch on what primary health care is in these countries and what it looks like. Um, and from our research, we were able to discern four main characteristics that make uh, primary health care successful in a lot of these places. And those are um, increasing a number of health care staff, and so you're doing a lot of that with some of the training programs you're doing. Um, proper supply chain system for the drugs and laboratory systems, also something that you're working on, the supply chain aspect. Um, the improved transport services and infrastructure. And finally, sufficient in water and sanitation. These are things that, of course, coming from the United States, we don't normally think of you know, water and sanitation as being an issue in the delivery of these services. But of course, in some of the rural areas, it is a huge issue. Um, not that you're working on that, but of course, without that, a lot of what you're trying to do can't happen. Um, so we started there, and then in our research, we came across that essentially, the way to make a change in this industry would be to to start collaborating and working with the different stakeholders in this um, industry, including NGOs, governments, all of that, um, and private businesses, um, and then organize service delivery, better service delivery, uh, financing mechanisms, um, contracting between agencies, um, and then also from there empowering local communities and, and the actors within those communities that are making the changes happen on the ground. From there, we decided that we think, um, given what you're trying to do and the way that you're trying to do it at this point, that the, the best place to start doing all of this would be in Botswana. First, it's the logistical proximity to your South African headquarters. Secondly, uh, the fact that Botswana has relatively well-developed national in infrastructure from what our research has shown. Um, there's also a presence of a large middle class and high per capita income. And finally, um, from what we could tell, it looks like there's a very strong government commitment to healthcare. And we came across, I don't know if you're familiar with the organization Health Hub, it's more it's more of like a movement that the Botswana government um, federal government has passed they've passed the innovation health hub essentially <laughs> to roll out a number of um, medical programs that Jessica can touch on a lot of them well it, so it's an in initiative by the Ministry of Health and it's 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 interesting because it's a commercial as well as a public health endeavor they see the potential to make money for and to build the economy through the, the healthcare industry. So it's an interesting take. It's a business take on health through the government. Their mission is to identify specific initiatives that will enable Botswana to transform delivery 
and become the regional center of excellence by stimulating multi-stakeholder participation. I mean, this just like sung Hello Healthcare to me in terms of potential opportunities to partner um, with, with a government entity that would be really supportive of what you're trying to do, both on the ground, you know, because of your values-driven mission, but also as a business. While we're finishing on Botswana, do you have any other do you have any questions or input? We're going to move on to another section. I will bombard you with questions at the end. Okay, perfect. All right. So we'll move on now to um, what software and the potential that it has for uh, developing and expansion of medical services in Africa and Anatolia will take away. Okay. Well, uh, we were looking at the uh, importance of IT and uh, we thought, of, uh, how do you do you manage to deal with so many countries uh, that, that, that don't, uh, in Africa that you're already present or you're going to expand into. So um, we, we thought that the best solution is uh, you need to go on cloud computing. I'm not sure whether you're using it or not. Um, so the, the uh, advantages uh, of cloud computing is services uh, like uh, data mining and data an analytics to um, predict the, the trends and what's going on in Africa. And then uh, other things we, we found is uh, cell phones that could be a cheap uh, way to, to, to source the, the data and in combination with uh, uh, non-profit organizations like uh, Utahidi and Healthcare, uh, HealthMap. It is possible uh, to use uh, mobile phones, just a simple text message uh, services automatically appear on, on the map and you have real-time data, uh, for example, uh, births in, in Africa, plan, for example, vaccination to, uh, to make sure that uh, children do not uh, die young. For you to partner the, the, the services uh, will, will be, uh, I think, a great idea and it will help uh, planning uh, supplies of vaccines. Uh, this, uh, this kind of services were great, for example, in Syria. You, you, could, uh, you could see you know, what's happening in those countries, you know, how many people die. The same things you, you can do, for example, with malaria, when, when the company's uh, primary health care you know, will be able to react uh, more promptly to the outbreaks of the diseases. Yeah. Very good point. Very, very good point. And the first thing to what I'll tell you towards the end. Uh, you actually mentioned that Africa with the mobile phones it's not what uh, it is in Europe. And the problems could be with charging mobile phones. So we, we thought, uh, for example, mobile phone charges can, can be distributed uh, through clinics. You know, the other handheld chargers uh, or bicycle uh, attach uh, the, these chargers to the bicycles. There is uh, uh, this guy called uh, Michael Onyangwe in Kenya. He, he manufactures uh, uh, dynamos that attach to the bus probably one of the most common uh, means of transportation in Africa. So this was um, something that just really stood out to me in your case. Um, I mean, you know a little bit about my background, but um, part of the reason that I'm in business is because I see such incredible opportunity for business to do good, um, and because it has the resources to resources to do that, to enact that change now. Um, working for nonprofits the vast majority of my life, I found that I spent the vast majority of my time raising money um, to spend the, less, the, the minority of my time doing the work that I actually wanted to do. Um, and then I saw the impact that businesses could have on communities, even on a small local, local level. I really believe in, in the powers of collaboration and networks in cross-sector um, alliances. And so this was an issue that really stuck out for me as an amazing opportunity for you. Being a very people-centered, value-centered business, I know that you also acknowledge that this is a really important part of, of how you do business. Um, and, and it's clear in the model, the cooperative model as well. Um, on the next slide, I talk a little bit about collaboration and cross-sector partnerships in particular because I wasn't able to see a place in your model that you're working much with NGOs. Um, I know you do a little bit with government here and there just by the nature of your work, but um, I think it's a clear gap in the way that your business is doing business at this point. And the reason that it's important is because it, it fits with your mission. If your mission is to leave the world in a better state, you have to work with all the different stakeholders who are who are working on the same issues. And in Africa, clearly NGOs have a huge presence. 
um, when it comes to providing health care. From my research, um, I was able to discern that most single sector solutions will often fail. Where these problems are so dynamic and so complex, oftentimes having multi-sector approaches um, creates a more holistic solution to the problem. Um, and so there are specific benefits that I would like to identify for why businesses should partner with NGOs. Some of the reasons are because it can create better employee motivation, loyalty and pro productivity. So just focus on, on your own employees and knowing that they're value driven and they're doing really good work and they're actually creating a difference. The other reasons are strengthening stakeholder relationships, critical, um, giving a stronger license to operate, say with governments, knowing that you're working with all these different organizations who have a rapport, providing opportunities for positive brand differentiation, especially for businesses, like you said on Facebook, Collaborating is just hard. Working with people is hard. However, the product can be that much more rich with different ideas and different perspectives. Market development, so NGOs often have access on the ground to new markets, to, um, to leaders, to new products and services that are arising on the very local level because they're in it. Um, and then finally, a better understanding of development issues from that perspective, from that sector's perspective which can lead to organizational learning and system change, which is what we're doing. There are many different levels of engagement. Um, and a lot of models that will work for one company won't work for another. And so I was trying to figure out how this could be done for your company. With one NGO, you might want to work on developing a product. With another, you might want to work on creating a solution. You might want to source something for an NGO um, that you can do so, do so more cost effectively than can, say, another company. So different levels of engagement that have to fit the unique situation and the unique partnership between your company and that entity. Some partnerships are going to be short term, some are going to be long term, um, they are very temporal. Our observation that the strongest partnerships tend to be those um, that have arrived in an agreed and very explicit definition of what they need, what their, what their purpose of their partnership is. So that has to be divine, defined very clearly from the outset so that both, um, both partners know or have an understanding of what they want from this agreement and how long it will last. We've identified a few local and national NGOs. We've, we think these are going to be more effective for Hello Healthcare than, say, international NGOs, which are working on a larger scale, um, because these are the ones on the ground who are working with local leaders, not just people who are in an office in New York or something. This is, so this is a specific model of um, the types of partnerships between an NGO and business. Um, and this is an amazing paper I found, but this is the business type, and this is what I think fits what you're trying to do. It's a, a model of collaborating and partnering with an NGO um, or government, government body, um, which helps you still retain your, um, your drive to make money. To, I mean, not that you, as you acknowledge, that's not your sole drive, but in order to sustain yourself as a business, as opposed to a nonprofit, which you've chosen to pursue a cooperative business model, you need to make money. And this is a way that you can work with NGOs and provide the services they need and make money off of it and help them do the work that they're trying to do. But I have worked in the nonprofit sector, I've worked in the government sector, and I was frustrated by both. I felt like I was banging my head against a wall, against bureaucracies, and I see businesses being able to move without asking for permission, as you said. Um, but I, I still, I reiterate like the points about, I understand it's difficult to collaborate, but I really couldn't emphasize more coming from both of those sectors how much it would be needed to create new models where all three are working together, like you said, where you are providing this amazing research, resources and, and skills to nonprofits who maybe don't have the know-how that you do to do this in such an efficient, entrepreneurial manner. So I uh, wanna be there when you could be there. And I often know that while doing the MBA, but it's sometimes Shift another case study, shift more discussions forced upon you. But know that this is not a case study like some of the other ones, which are, you know, Microsoft or General Electric or something like that, which are, you know, that whatever discussion or suggestion you make, it doesn't end up on anybody's table. This is discussion about the company which is growing, about a program and a little adventure which is literally happening as we speak. 
So for that, I really appreciate your time and your input, and I will keep you very much updated. In fact, I just tweeted about you guys on Twitter. <laughs>